Hello there. The following lesson was recorded a while back, and we had some big old audio technical difficulties. I was going to re-record the episode, and I just haven't found the time. So I'm going to just preface the following lesson by apologizing for the horrible sound quality, and I hope that you still enjoy the lesson. Until next time, blessed be. Welcome back. I hope you are having a wonderful week. It's excellent to be back with you today. And of course, we'll start out by answering a few questions. And if you have a question that you'd like for me to attempt to answer, uh, you can either send an email to ariel at the dcw.org, or if you are on the forums at the dcw.999.org, go ahead and just send me a private message, a PM, uh, with your question. Uh, if you if you ask a question on the forum, I probably won't take it on the air. Uh, I'd rather you actually either email me or private message me so that I know that you want this taken on the air. All right, so let's see. We have uh, a couple questions from Atori, who's on our forum, and we appreciate um, Atori's um, involvement. First, it says, can you associate a thought form with a stone. I know it's kind of silly to have a pet rock, but I think it would help me a lot if I could have something for a host of a thought form. And if I could do this, is there special precautions I need to take or a certain ritual? Well, that is uh, a very excellent question. And absolutely, that is under the, um, when you when you associate a thought form with an object, then it's starting to get into the realm of either talismanic magic or uh, that of an amulet. And just uh, for basic um, terminology here, an amulet refers usually to an object that is imbued with a thought form of protection, and a talisman is imbued with a thought form that is going to elicit change, such as prosperity or love, uh, good fortune, luck, that kind of thing. So absolutely, when you so when you're doing your thought form, like we were describing earlier, um, instead of giving the thought form a place in your home, just give your thought form the place within the the stone, and it's a, an excellent idea if you are to um, go ahead and research the the correspondences of gemstones, so that you will choose a gemstone that corresponds with the purpose of your thought form. So um, hopefully that makes sense. And and there's a lot of great correspondences online for that, or you can uh, get Cunningham's uh, Gemstones book, Scott Cunningham's book of gemstones. That's a, an excellent resource. Um, if you're if you are um, familiar with seven seven seven, you could you could even use Crowley's um, correspondences. Uh, if you understand basic astrological correspondences of what the seven planets and or the set of the twelve signs of the zodiac mean, you basically have then an understanding of the um, the most important correspondences in in magic. So when you can find something that corresponds to the planet and or the zodiacal sign of the of the purpose in question then uh, you can just use that gemstone, that herb. I mean, the same thing, the same thing goes, but if you, if you want to make one of those, and we'll, we'll get into this when, when we do a, a class on talismans and, and amulets, um, but if you have a, like an herb pouch or, or you know, like a, a, one of those pouches uh, that you can either make or buy, a cloth pouch that you fill with, with a combination of herbs and stones and, 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 and the such, um, again, just having the, the the pouch itself isn't going to do you that much good. It you know it 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 does have the the power of correspondence working for it based on whatever it is that you put in there, but it doesn't have necessarily any major magical power in and of itself. However, it is able to house your thought form, so that when you carry that thought form around with you via the pouch or whatever other talisman you're using, uh, then it, then the, the then the thought form is um, is activated by either 
a triggering device that you give it or it's constantly active. So hopefully that makes sense. And yeah, it's a very good question and I'm glad you brought it up. And it also says here in the same uh, email, I have been very busy and I am off on a summer break with my parents. Probably since this is kind of an older email and I haven't been uh, podcasting as regularly, maybe this is a, <laughs> hopefully it's not an obsolete question. It says, I cannot have the time alone to do my spells, rites, and rituals. I can't even meditate because I will get interrupted and come out of it very ir- irritable. I am still, quote, in the broom closet. So do you have solutions or ideas to fix this little problem? Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's called going to the bathroom. <laughs> when you That's one place that you can usually be assured that you can have five minutes to yourself. It's just going to the bathroom or when you're taking a shower or uh, if you have a little bit of, uh, when you wake up in the morning, if you're not going to be, you know, if you don't have to get up right away, you can take an extra five minutes in bed with your eyes closed. Or if you're not too exhausted that you're going to fall right asleep at the end of the day, you can take an extra five or 10 minutes in bed before you drift off to sleep to do your meditations. Obviously, you're not going to be using your incense and, and all of that, but um, you can do all of your uh, daily magical practice in a mental realm. You can do chakra um, or um, energy center work. You can do all kinds of things. You can do grounding and centering. You can do uh, you can do your spiritual purifications just as you're taking your shower uh, by imbuing the, the 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 shower water with white light. Um, uh, so yes, you, you can. That's the great thing about the craft is you don't need anything special. You can be so in the broom closet you don't have one tool that you don't have um, any witchy thing at all. You just make whatever is available in your natural, ordinary life um, part of your practice. Then then your life becomes your craft. And ultimately, that is the goal, is not necessarily to... Um, you know, to 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 become so witchy that you that you know that you scare your friends and neighbors. It's that you start to integrate your craft into your your daily life, so that all of your life becomes part of your magic. So you don't need anything special, and you don't necessarily need a whole lot of time to do this stuff. But um, you know, if everybody has a diary, you know that, that you you're not necessarily. Uh, going to be outed just because you're writing in a journal, so you can be doing a lot of um, of journaling in your in your grimoire, and it doesn't have to look like anything special. And if you want to get a diary with a little lock on it, then then you can do that if you're afraid of what people are going to see. So absolutely, hopefully. Oh, and thank you for telling me a Tori is a girl, <laughs> and I appreciate everybody who lets me know and keep letting me know, even if you've told me before, because I will forget. All right, we have another question from Nubian. It says, I have a question about the spirit guide meditation. I've looked for answers, but haven't found anything. While I was doing a spirit guide meditation, not from your podcast, but from a book by Christopher uh, Penzak, I came in contact with what I believe to be a spirit. I didn't experience any discomfort at all. I found this spirit to be very engaging and relaxed. But here's the weird part. The spirit and I were intimate, if you get my meaning. I was meditating, and I know that I wasn't asleep. I felt exactly like having I was having sex. That's how I was experiencing him. Now, I want to stress what I didn't feel anything wrong in any of this. I was comfortable. I didn't feel forced or coerced into anything. Since then, I've encountered the Spirit again while meditating, and he just seems to sit next to me and meditate with me. Or this is how I experience him. He has given me his name. He hasn't said anything else, but just stays with me while I meditate. So what's up? All right. So um, I, that's not an uncommon question. Um, the incubus succubus kind of thing that can go on um, can be something that you want to be aware of and very careful of. Now, Al Manning talks about uh, this a spirit lover, which is a very positive thing. And um, and your spirit lover is, is um, like a spirit guide, but more like a, uh, a sense of a, of, a, of a mate, like a sexual partner on the on on the astral plane 
And it's not like an incubus succubus relationship where it's draining you. Um, so if that's indeed what you're feeling and you're feeling exhilarated afterwards after the experience and, and it's completely consensual on your part and you have a complete say in the matter, then I don't see anything wrong with it at all. You know, it's, it can be a very positive thing. However, if you feel like even though it's not you're not coerced or forced, but you're not really consenting, it's sort of like you're going along with it. Um, then ask yourself this, if you were to say, no, thank you, not right now, what would happen? And also, do you feel more enlivened after the experience? Do you feel um, like like it was a very positive experience? Or do you have any sense of, of being tired or drained afterwards? If you're being tired or drained afterwards, then I wouldn't consider it a very positive experience, and you, and you are being drained. In which case, I would definitely go back to doing your spiritual purification, your grounding and centering, and your orb of light, and... Um, be very firm in the fact that um, you, that you no longer want to be a part of that relationship. Um, you have the ultimate say, and no, no one or nothing has the power to um, coerce you into anything. But again, if you feel like it was completely consensual and it was a positive experience, then there's nothing wrong with it. Hopefully that helps you. Okay, Midnight has a terminology question. Let's see. Okay. This is more of a general question that probably doesn't need to be answered in the forum or on the podcast. Oh, okay. Well, then never mind. I won't answer it since you said that. Let's look. Um, let's see if we have anything else going on in here. Okay, the rest of these questions look like they are personal and don't want to be taken on the air. So let me, let me check one more place, and then we'll get going with our lesson. All right, here's one from, oh, let's see, Luna. I just started your pod class and it is very interesting, tying up a lot of loose ends for me. I love the part about creating a name. I'm trying to be patient and follow the order of the class. My questioning is the grounding and orb meditations. Should you release them before you cast your circle or after? Thank you for your time. Okay, um, it's not really the, the orb of light. Okay, the grounding is there's nothing really to release. It's just a, it's like taking a shower. Um, in grounding. So the, the, um, the, the, all the excess energy as part of that meditation should have already drained out of your body. So there's really nothing to release with the grounding. The orb of light, you don't necessarily need to release, but what you will do is just let the vision fade from your conscious mind. That's what I would recommend on the orb of light. If you feel like there's too much energy, if you feel real hyped up or, or amped up after doing an orb of light meditation, obviously you're going to let the excess energy drain out of your body just like you do in the grounding and centering um, it's in, until you feel good again. So hopefully that makes some sense to you. Okay, now Star Child um, said that I could take these on the air, and there's a, several questions here, so I'm going to try to take them fairly rapidly so I don't take up too much of our time. One, I was reading in one book that it is not necessary to cast a magic circle every time you do magic. This particular author saves that for heavy magic or the sabbats and esbats. She says that the choice is mine. What's your take on this? Okay, I do go into that a lot um, in several podcasts, and I agree. It's not necessary to cast a magic circle for everything. Um, so you may want to, um, you know, when you get to the, the lesson on casting a circle, I think we go into that a little bit more into detail. Uh, number two, I'm a little unclear on the aspects of the deity issue. I understand the whole duality concept, and I understand that the pantheons are manifestations of the god and goddess. What I don't yet have an understanding of just yet is, if you chose to work a specific god and goddess from, say, the Greek pantheon as opposed to god and goddess in abstract, do you, re do you replace the candle representations on your altar with statues instead? Okay, first of all, um, that's an excellent question. This is a non-denominational um, system. So we don't necessarily, there's many people who, who work a witch's primer who don't even work with deities at all. They, they just work with their own personal power. So that's not, that's, that sounds more of a Wiccan question than it is a witch's primer question. This is witchcraft um, that is more in line with, 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 um, with building and using magic and not necessarily um, working with deities and um, the religious aspects. However, I will say 
that if you do have a candle representation on your altar that is dedicated to a specific deity, you can just instead of, uh, of replacing that with a statue, you can reserve that candle for when you work with that deity again and use a different candle for another deity if you have a candle that you have anointed specifically for a deity. Um, so you don't need a statue necessarily if you're using a candle. Just just set it aside, maybe even put it away and wrap it up and label it so you know, you know, this is the Bridget candle. And so when you invoke Bridget again, you can just take that candle out. Or another thing you can do is if you're using small candles, after you've done your your ritual using those deities, you can allow those candles to burn down and out by themselves, just like when you're doing candle magic, which we haven't even started to cover yet. Um, so hopefully that's that makes sense. All right. Um, let's see. Number 2A. In a book I read, the author said to dedicate your altar to a specific god or goddess for a year to build a relationship with that deity, after which time you can rededicate your altar. Would I then have three different statues on my altar? Okay, I don't know who that author is. Never done that. I don't see the need for it. I guess if you're really religious um, and you're interested in... in um, uh, building, you know, relationships with particular deities, then you could do that. And if you have, um, you know, if, if you want to do that, there's nothing wrong with it, but I don't do it. And I don't necessarily use a lot of statues. I used to, but it's just not my thing anymore. So um, it's totally up to you, you know, just do what, what feels right to you. There's no, there's, there's no witch police, I always say. Okay, number three, the only place I can go in my home to get peace and time enough alone to do ritual is outside in our dedicated brick potting shed. It's actually very nice. After clearing the space, the sink inside the shed actually prevents me from walking in a circle inside the shed. Can I instead set up the magic circle around the whole shed? Do I have to measure out a perfect circle or can I wing it? Okay, again, when you listen to the, the podcast on casting a circle, I think I'm pretty clear on that. You don't even need to mark out a circle boundary if, if it's not, if, you know, physically, if it's not um, feasible for you to do that. You can, when you cast the circle, visualize the circle as being um, anywhere you want it to be. Yes, and you can include the whole shed or you can include just the sink, however you want to do it. Uh, you, you, can, you can make it be as big or as small as you decide it should be. Okay, number four, if the smoke and smell of incense is too much for me during ritual, can I use a feather to symbolize Aaron's st stead and save the incense for when I, I want to do incense magic? Again, this is something I cover several times on the podcast, um, and you just probably haven't gotten to these episodes yet. You don't ever need to use any tool, including incense, if you don't want to. Um, and yes, you can use a feather on your altar if that's what, what represents error to you and you want to represent all four elements in balance, which is a nice idea to have. Um, and you don't need incense unless you like to use it. Okay. And then finally, she asks, um, I think it's a she, at what point do I do my dedication ritual? I'm guessing before my tool consecration and after learning to pull up the circle. I'm not sure what you mean by dedication ritual. Are you talking about like a wickening or something like that? Again, that's not something that we do here at which is Primer. We are a non-initiatory path. Um, this is a personal, um, it, it's a personal eclectic witchcraft training that uh, is for your magical effectiveness and so that you can train yourself to be an effective witch and work magic uh, to better your life. There's no need to do a dedication. If you want to do a dedication, absolutely, you can do that whenever you want to do that. All right, hopefully that works for you. And I will uh, obviously answer any questions. And if for some reason I haven't answered your question, it's not because I didn't want to. It's because I didn't organize my notes well enough and I somehow lost it in the... In the uh, in all of the, I have so many of these emails and things like that. So, so ask it again and um, don't be shy. And I will, I promise, address it. All right, that was a long question and answer. So we'll get right to our lesson. It's uh, 
there's before I get into the the meat of the lesson, which is wand magic today, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what you can do to uh, if you've done all of your your um, you know your five bodies, your your the um, the, the uh, building your power base, what you can do to keep your magic very effective is a daily exercise, and it's very similar to the will list from the fire body week, but it's a lot easier, all right? And this is a, a good thing, just if you can incorporate this into a daily exercise that you never, you know, that you'll always do it. Don't freak out if you forget a day or if you miss a day. Don't, don't do that to yourself. But if you can get into the habit of doing this one every day, you're going to be surprised at how much more effective your magic gets. And I call it the magic list. And I've seen many different types of um, versions of this throughout my, my life, and uh, both in the, in the uh, witchcraft traditions as well as some of the New Age traditions and just some of the self-help traditions. But, uh, and it's got all kinds of different names but I call it the magic list. And it looks very much like the will list, except for it's very easy, where the will list was about muscle building, building your magical will. This instead is more subtle, and it's very powerful because it gets you used to being very successful at, at, at creating things in your life. All you do is you take your, um, you can have a, a notebook dedicated just to magic list, and you just take a new sheet every day, and you, and you make a list of 20 to 25 things that you know are going to be done that day. Things like, I will get out of bed. I will eat some food. I will breathe. I will take a shower. I will put on shoes. I will get in my car. I will uh, drive to work. I will take off my clothes. I will go to bed. You only put things on that list which you know you're going to do. You absolutely know that these are things that you're going to do. It's not things that you that you're that, that are at all a stretch. In fact, if there's any hint of that it might be a stretch that you you wonder if you're actually going to get that thing done, don't put it on that list. And you can do if you can do this in the morning um, or the night before, that's great. And then you just be, and then at the end of the day, you just check it off, or the next morning before you do your next will, your um, not will list, but your next magic list. You just check off everything on that on that all the items, and if it's the same exact list every single day, that's fine. That's fine as long as you know that you're really going to do those things. You put them on that list, and then you check them off. It sounds kind of redundant if you don't understand, but this over time builds up so much. Um, of, of a sense of when I say I'm going to do something, I do it, that your magic starts to happen very, very quickly and very easily. So I would recommend that this is something that you incorporate into your daily practice. Now, what happens if you do your magic list at, say, 10 or 11 in the morning and you've already done a bunch of things beforehand? It's okay. You can go back in time and say, I will get up in the morning. Even though you've already done it, you've gone back in time <laughs> and you've said you're going to do it that day. It doesn't matter if you've already done those things. But just do one 24-hour block of, of activities uh, per day. Write them all out, 20 to 25 things. Write them all out, what you're going to do that day, and check them all off um, before you do the next list for the following day. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Start trying that. Try, try doing that and see how, see how you feel after maybe two or three weeks of doing that or, or four weeks of doing that. See how much more effective things get for you. Amazing. All right, this, is, this lesson is actually very short. It's called Wand Magic. And what is more magical than a magic wand, right? What, is, what, what says um, witch or druid or, or fairy or magician more than magical wand. Okay, so the the typical magic wand is made of wood. You can make your own wand, or these days you can actually find wand makers who make wands. And it can be very rustic looking, or it can be very ornate. 
It can have stones in it, or it can be plain. It can be wrapped with metal. It can be whatever you want it to be. Just know that this is not the same thing as your elemental air wand, or if you are in a tradition that uses a fire wand, it's not the same thing as an elemental wand. This is a magic wand. This is a spell wand. This is a wand for working your magic. And whatever you decide you want, you can have more than one of these. Because if you look at the magical correspondences for different woods, each wood corresponds to different types of magic. So you could have a wand for prosperity, a wand for protection, a wand for, you know, love. You could have one for divination. You could have that if you wanted it. There's nothing wrong with that. Or you could decide that there's one type of wood that that um, speaks to you more or resonates with you more or seems more all-purpose to you. and um, Or you could have a wand made of several different types of wood. It, you, you can do it however you want. You can, you can, like I said, you can make it yourself or you can have somebody make it. Wand makers are, are there's some really good ones on, online and, and out there. Um, so you don't have to make it yourself. It's not necessarily more, quote, magical if you make it yourself. I disagree with that. If you if you find somebody that, that's a, a good craftsperson that would make a b- more beautiful, pleasing wand than something that you could come up with yourself and you like something that's more composed, by all means, have one made for you. But what you want to do when you consecrate this thing is you want to consecrate it to each of the four elements. You want it to be consecrated, or if you want to consecrate, if you want to think of it as consecrating it to all five elements, you could do it that way. Um, and you you will um, when you you could do it inside of a circle if you wanted to. And then when you're consecrating the the wand again, if you've consecrated your magical tools, you understand the basic drill here is you cleanse it and then you imbue it with the with the elements with the, with whatever the energy you want. And so for instance, and I'm going to let you start to create your own rituals rather than me giving you a prescription. But for instance, something you could do when you are when you are consecrating your magic wand is you could um if you're in the um northern hemisphere, um you could uh, uh after you've cleansed it, you could um face or go to the northern part of your circle where you have placed a dish of earth and you could sprinkle earth on the wand and say, I dedicate and consecrate this wand to the element of earth. And then you could move to the east where you have some incense smoke, um, that, uh, that you, that you know, ch- charcoal, and you put some, some incense granules on that charcoal and smoke starts coming off. And you say, I dedicate this wand to the element of air and to the direction of the east something like that. And then you could move over to the south and then there's a candle burning there and you could just gently move it through the burning candle flame and say, I dedicate this wand to the element of fire and to the direction of the south. And then you can move over to the west and you have a bowl of, of water in the west. Um, maybe uh, you've even put a little bit of, you know, rose, you know, rose water or something in there, something fragrant that, that, that smells delicious or lavender or something. And you sprinkle it with the water and you say, I dedicate this wand to the element of water in the direction of the West. And then you can move to the center and you could raise it up on high and you say, I dedicate this wand to the heavens. And then you could um, point it down to the earth and you say, I dedicate this wand to the earth below me. Father Sky and Mother Earth, however you want to say it, so that you feel like this wand encompasses all the elements, right? And above and below. And then once you feel like it's consecrated, then you, then you, um, uh, there's, there's a, an old wanding tradition, um, and there's a book about this that, that I like a lot of what he says in, uh, what is his name? Evan Rowe, and I think that the book is out of print. Um, and I can't remember all of the details from this book, but a lot of it was good. Um, and I think it's just called Wanding. But um, he talks about how you name your wand, like the, that you that you call upon a spirit of the wand. And what you can do with this is once you've once you've consecrated it, um, and, a, and a good time to consecrate your your magic wand is obviously at the full moon. Okay, then you get very very quiet. And you ask for the name of the spirit of your wand, and you listen. And once you've come up with, and you feel like you you understand that, like the name of your your wand is 
symphonious or something, you know, whatever it is, then you, then you, uh, then you make a note of that. And every time then after you, and then you wrap up your wand, you wrap it up in a, in a silk, um, or, or put it in a box or something very special and you put it away. Then when you're ready to, to do a spell, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to pull your wand out and you're going to, you're going to call on the spirit name of that wand. Like we said, symphonious. And I just, I just came up with that out of thin air. Um, and you say, I call upon the spirit of my wand, symphonious. And you then are ready to do your magic. And all you do is you take whatever it is that you're working on and you can incorporate in th this into a larger spell or you can just do a magic wand spell. And what you do is you, you've, you've um, come up with what you're working on and in your mind you visualize that which you want and you come up with a, um, just like you're working a, a thought form. In fact, it's better before you, better before you start working wand magic that you um, get good at building thought forms because you're basically going to be building a thought form with your wand. So once you once you come up with the image in your mind of that which you are what you desire, you condense it into um, a very easy chant, or uh, a simple sentence, or, or or affirmation is fine, and you draw in the air a, a very easy symbol of that which it is that you are um, um, trying to to create such as for money, you could use a dollar sign, uh, etc. For love, you could use a heart, you know, real, real easy. And you keep tracing that, that uh, symbol in the air in front of you while you are chanting your chant over and over again until you feel like that thought form has been built. And then when you're ready, if it's a one, if, 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 if it's a quickie thought form, you release the thought form with the wand to go and and uh, manifest. If it's a a permanent thought form or or you're, uh, it's an ongoing thought form, you give it a place to um, give it a place to to rest, just like when you were building the thought form. Uh, if you are doing like we talked about earlier in the question and answer uh, session, if you're if you're building a, a talisman or an amulet, then you direct that thought form into the talisman or the amulet. So your wand then becomes the tool by which you are building these thought forms. And wanding magic works beautifully. It takes practice. It takes practice. Don't worry if you don't get great results right away with it. But keep using your wand. Keep building your thought forms with your wand. And wand magic is extremely effective. You may become so good at doing wand magic that you don't need anything else. You just need your wand. And you take out, and eventually you might not even need your wand. But I love the wand. There's something so archetypal about a magic wand that um that you build up this relationship with your wand and i wish i could find you know i'm going to i'm going to look in my old journals i had a teacher once that gave me a great quote about wands and i cannot remember what i did with it i'm going to find it and i will i will include it in a future a future podcast but it's a beautiful quote and um once you once you become more and more adept at using your wand for for wand magic uh, it it sort of takes you up to a new level. It's pretty much the sky's the limit. Um, and and um, I recommend that you give it a try if you're at all um, attracted to this kind of thing. The problem is that these days, wand magic has sort of degenerated into sort of Harry Potter fantasy kind of stuff, which is fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong. I, I love Harry Potter, but it's sort of like sometimes you, you're like, okay, is it real or is it some sort of fantasy game? You know, there's there's sort of a there's sort of this weird sort of land that people are existing in, where they're sort of playing this sort of new version, nouveau Dungeons and Dragons kind of thing with the Harry Potter magic and wands and things like that. And then there's those of us who are old school who are actually no, we're not. This isn't a fantasy. We really do this to create change in in the real world. <laughs> so, um, so you know, don't don't be discouraged if if it, if at first you think, oh my gosh, am I am I one of these weird Harry Potter Harry Harry Potter Harry Potter freaks? You know, don't worry about that. 
give it a try. Give it a good, you know, try, try working with it for several months, though, and see if you don't uh, become very adept at creating change in the world. Okay, that's really all the time we have today. I hope this was of some use to you. And again, I love hearing from you, and we will get into some more wonderful lessons. I am going to be gone for the bulk of uh, the month of September. I'm going to be out of the country, so don't fret if I don't do any uh, episodes for a while. I will be back, but I hopefully will get at least one or two episodes in before I leave. All right, love and blessings. Until next time, Mary Part. Thank you.